And it's that they take all the definitions you've given in your talks and all the theorems and weigh them against each other. And uh, if it's too many definitions and not enough theorems, you don't get to go to a good place. And um, this talk does not bode well for my afterlife. All right, with that uh, out of the way, um, so model categories are sort of, um, the, they were um, uh, Quillen came up with them in, I think, 67. Um, and they've sort of um, been the, the, for a long time, they were the cutting edge formalism for talking about the homotopy theory. Um, abstract homotopy theory in general is about notions of equivalence. Um, specifically about uh, weakening notions of equivalence. So for example, um, in topological spaces, instead of homeomorphism, we can think about homotopy. Uh, instead of in chain complexes, instead of uh, chain isomorphisms, we think about quasi isomorphisms. Um, and then in category, in general, uh, in category, th in, in, the gen in general categories, um, isomorphism is our notion of equivalence. So um, what we want to think about is weakening notions of isomorphism. Um, there's, a, there's this notion of a homotopical category. Um, which on NLAB means something specific, but I'm using here to mean something much vaguer. Um, so you in a, in a homotopical category, you have a collection of morphisms, which we're going to call weak equivalences. Um, which behave like isomorphisms in some way, uh, but fail to be um, invertible. Uh, and often the way that they um, try to act like, the, the, often the way that they act like isomorphisms without being invertible is that under some functor, they become isomorphisms. Um, all right, so, if you have some, some homotopical category, the question is, what if we just formally added in inverses for all of the weak equivalences? Um, and it turns out that, um, so here C is some category, the, um, W is, is uh, my collection of weak equivalences, and this is um, some construction uh, due to Gabriel and Zisman. Um, called the category of fractions. Um, and this might not even be a category, or at least it might not be locally small. Um, and even if it is, it can be quite difficult to use. And uh, the solution is model categories. Um, but before we get to actually talking about model categories, we're going to do uh, a quick digression on lifting. Um, do you even like I'm sorry, but uh, why don't we just use the rough category on this context? If we want to turn the wicked front into isomorphism, why don't we just use the categories? Right. So the point is that that can be hard to describe. Like that, they can be hard to get your hands on, and model categories give you tools for doing that. They let you port a lot of the techniques from classical homotopy theory, like topological homotopy, over into whatever context you. If you have a model category, um, it lets you describe things in the derived category. Um, um, all right, so first I'm going to talk about lifting. So if we have two maps, um, I and P, uh, in some category M, I'm going to use M for most of my ambient categories um, here. Uh, if for all commutative squares of this form, uh, there exists a map phi from B to X, so a map here, 
such that the diagram still commutes, we say that I has the left lifting property with respect to P and P has the right lifting property with respect to I. Um, note here, I'm not requiring any sort of uniqueness in the lifts. Um, and we will write um, I and then this little box with a line through it, P, to indicate that I has the left lifting property with respect to P and P has the right lifting property with respect to I. Um, I think we can all agree that uh, this little box with a line through it is one of just the best pieces of notation because it's, it's, it's so clearly describing the thing that it's notating. Um, okay, so uh, now given, given some collection of maps I in, in my category, I'm going to write um, the box as a superscript for I on the right, uh, it to be the set of all um, maps G in the category that lift on the right against um, all maps F in my um, set of more, in my collection of I. And similarly, um, on the putting it on the right um, means that it's the collection of all maps which lift on the right uh, for all F in this collection. All right, and then if if um, if, if some set of morphisms is contained in uh, one of these, then we write that, say, L lifts against I, uh, or I lifts against R. Um, okay. So, um, just another, another little um, thing that we'll need. So, a map F is a retractive G in in some category um, if there exists the following commutative diagram i'm leaving i'm going to leave out the objects just to avoid the clutter this definition of retract so f g, f so if there exists a commutative diagram like this so this is the identity and this is the identity then F is a retractive G, G um, and this matches the usual definition of retract in the arrow, arrow category of M, where, um, where the objects are arrows and the um, morphisms are commutative squares between them. All right, so uh, lifting properties. Um, these, these sets of these collections, I realize I'm using set notation, these collections of maps defined as being all of the maps which lift against some other collection uh, satisfy some closure properties. So um, lifting on the right uh, is closed under composition. Um, uh, retracts. and uh, pullbacks. Uh, and lifting on the left is also closed under composition, also closed under retracts, and it's closed under push out. Um, in fact, both of these cl uh, classes are closed under transfinite composition um, for if you have a string of maps um, that corresponds to some higher or some some large cardinal or ordinal I can never remember the difference between okay. and you just did some point to um, so just right. to be clear when you when but you say I, closed under pullbacks and pushouts you mean along arbitrary other maps in the category right yes yes sorry yes um, but I'll, I'll, I'll show the pushouts in a, in a second. So I'm going to quickly go through these closure properties. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so to see that lifting on the right is closed under composition, um, I'm going to suppose that I have a map I which lifts on the left against two maps F and G, 
and then show that it lifts against their composition. Um, and so the thing I need to do is start with some arbitrary square of the form on the uh, left uh, and show that there's a lift. Um, now I can rewrite this just by move, just by sort of uh, rotating the top a little bit. And then because I lifts against G, there's a map here, uh, which I'll call H. Um, and because it lifts, both of those triangles commute. And the top triangle in particular is this square with H on the bottom. Um, and so because I lifts against F, there's a lift here. M. Um, and then we have a lift here. Uh, and to make sure that the whole thing commutes, you sort of have to um, put H in here and see that all of the triangles are triangles that have appeared uh, previously. Um, so we've shown that uh, that lifting on the left is close under composition. A dual argument shows it for right. For both of these two different classes that you just turn, like each of these arguments generalizes in very obvious ways. Um, so sort of you just start writing things down and it all spills out. All right, now I want to show that lifting on the left is closed under retracts. So I'm going to start with um, with uh, with a map that lifts against F and say that G is a retractive F. So now I need to show that I have a lift in this diagram. Um, and I because G is a retract of F, I can draw this like this commutative diagram exists. Where this is the identity, this is the identity. All right, and then um, because and then be, because um, I lifts against F, you'll note that there's a there's a square with I on the left and F on the right, so I get a lift here. Uh, and then I can just take this composition here to get a map to G. Uh, and that map is this map here. Um, but those, those, the two identity maps just collapse down. And so we get a lift in our original square. Um, all right. And finally, I'll show that lifting on the right is closed under pushouts. So I'm going to say that um, P lifts again on the right against F, and G is a pushout of F, uh, meaning that it's a pushout along some um, a push out of F along some arrow here at the top. So I take a push out. Um, and then there's a map here as well. Uh, but now I have a square with P on the right and F on the left. And so I can, um, I get a lift here. Uh, and then because G is a push, uh, because this is the square on the left is a push out square. Um, I now have a cone to this top right corner, and so I get a, a unique map here. Uh, that's the lift that I want in that square. Um, by the universal property of pushouts. Okay, so those are the closure properties. Um, I like them. They're nice little diagrams that you can do with different colors. Um, uh, so the retract argument. Um, so is that if I if I have this commutative um, this commutative diagram here, uh, then if F lifts on the left against P, if it's a retractive I, if F lifts on the right against I, then F is a retractive P. Um, I, I realize this, this is a lot of like, look at these things, why should I care? where I'll get a second. Um, so we have uh, this diagram is really just the, the um, triangle with a the thing added. Um, so because F lifts against P there, so I'm just showing the first one, um, I get an arrow here. Uh, 
And now I get this retract diagram where this is one triangle, this is the other triangle, and then the third triangle. Uh, the yeah, I mean, these things correspond as, as I've written them down. Um, okay. Uh, now, the point of all this is to talk about weak factorization systems. Um, so, a weak factorization system on a category, on some category M, is you have two classes of maps, L and R, such that um, for any map in the category, we can write um, this map F as a composition uh, of two other maps. Uh, where the first map is in L and the second map is in R. So this is the factorization. Um, it doesn't, there's no requirement for uniqueness or anything. Um, the way I've written it down is kind of suggestive. Uh, if I and P can be realized as functors, um, then this, you would call this a fact, uh, functorial weak factorization system. Um, a lot of, Texts just kind of assume that um, factorization, the factorization in model categories is functorial. Uh, I know of at least one model category where it's been shown that it's not possible to have a functorial um, we fa uh, a functorial factorization. Um, but I, I, I think for the most part, it's best just to assume that you have one. Uh, all right. Um, the quantifiers on the this z of f thing is that like they're for each f there exists some z of f such that this works yeah so I, this like i get the point of this really is to be suggestive that there's like a functor here um that, that you can make these choices functorially but no the, it just you can just think of it as a formal symbol that there is some such thing and you don't have to actually be able to choose it functorially But for all for all maps F, there is some diagram of this form. Um, all right, and um, secondly, uh, L lifts on the left against R, and R lifts on the right against L. Okay. So that's what. Uh, so that's the definition of a weak factorization system. Um, Okay, now supposing we have a weak factorization system. Um, wait, no. Supposing we have two classes uh, of maps in our category, just satisfying this first um, this first axiom, and um, L and R are contained in uh, the maps that lift against them, then. Um, if L and R are closed under retracts, then L and R is a weak factorization system. Um, uh, and the way this goes is um, uh, you basically factor uh, each map. Uh, and apply the retract argument. All right. Um, so why do I care about this um, about this proposition? Well, we're finally ready to talk about model categories. So a model structure, On a bicomplete category, so that's a category with all small limits and co-limits, consists of three distinct classes of morphs. I'm calling them W, C, and F. Where W is the class of weak equivalents, and for that we put a little 
we got chilled on the um, C is the cast of co vibrations. Uh, and for that, we just leave a double arrow. Um, and F is the class of vibrations. And we put a double headed arrow on that. Okay. And these have to satisfy some axioms. Um, it's quite a lot here. So the first is um, the first axiom is the two out of three. Uh, property. So if two of, uh, so if we have a triangle of this form in the category, um, that's not a double headed arrow. Ugh. All right, so if we have a diagram of this form, if two of these maps are in the class of weak equivalences, then so is the third. Um, so that's uh, kind of the way that, um, the one way in which these look like isomorphisms. Um, yeah, okay. And then we have the uh, retracts. So all three of these classes are closed under taking retracts. Um, and then we have lifting, and we say that the co-fibrations lift on the left against the, um, the uh, intersection of the fibrations and the weak equivalences. Uh, so these are called either trivial vibrations, um, are called either trivial or acyclic vibrations. Personally, I think I prefer acyclic. Um, uh, and we also ask that the acyclic co-fibrations, nope, that's not it. The yeah, acyclic co-fibrations lift on the left against the fibrations. All right. Um, then this is all right. So that's the lifting axiom, um, and the last axiom is uh, factorizations. And so, for any f in this category, we ask that um, we have, we can factor it in two ways. Um, we can factor it as a, um, an acyclic cofibration followed by a fibration or as a cofibration followed by an acyclic fibration. All right, so, and then a model category is a bicomplete category with such a structure on it. Um, as mentioned in a uh, previous talk, different, like a given category can have multiple model structures on them. Um, and they can correspond to different notions of weakening equivalence, sort of depending on whether or not they have the same class of weak equivalence or not. Um, if they do have the same class, then they give you different ways of getting your hands on the, um, on the homotopy category, which we will get to. Um, so again, often people include functoriality of this factorization axiom. Um, but yeah, so there's a model structure due to Dan Isaacson on pro simplicial sets, which on which it is known that the factorization cannot be chosen to be functorial. Um, okay. So this is this is sort of like the classic definition um, of of a model structure on a category, um, and the whole point of talking about weak factorization systems is that this is garbage, and uh, and and the proposition we did up here 
gives us uh, a better definition. So I'm going to take this shrink it, put it outside, and I'm going to replace it with a different axiom, uh, which is that um, the class of co-fibrations and the class of acyclic fibrations um, and the class of acyclic co-fibrations with the fibrations, uh, these are weak factorization systems. And that carries all of the information of these previous axioms. Um, okay. Um, so maybe I made that too small. All right. Uh, so, um, the model, the definition of model categories is overdetermined. In the sense that if you um, pick, if you say what two of your classes are, it determines the third class. So because, um, yeah, so the, um, it, it was the, it was the fact that, um, uh, that these two, th these two different, um, the co vibrations and the acyclic vibrations, for instance, satisfied one here, were closed under attracts, um, and, and were closed under attracts were the thing that made it so that it was a weak factorization system. Um, now, uh, if we know what C is, if we know what the class of co-fibrations is, then um, because, well, because these are weak factorization systems, um, if we know the class of vibrations and the class of weak equivalences, then the class of co-fibrations is just everything that lifts on the left against those. If instead, we know the class of co-fibrations and the class of weak equivalences, then the vibrations are just the class of every map that lifts on the right against those. Um, and if uh, the co-fibrations and the vibrations are known, um, then uh, we know um, the acyclic vibrations, because that's everything that lifts on the right against the co-fibrations. And we know the um, acyclic co-fibrations, because they're just everything that lifts on the left against the vibrations. Um, and then we just use uh, factorization and uh, and two out of three. Uh, because our factorization guarantees that um, you can pick either of them, that one of the maps will be a weak vibration, uh, will be acyclic. And we know which are the acyclics on the other side. And then if both of those are acyclic, that corresponds precisely to when the original map was um, a weak equivalence. Okay, so I've talked about, I've defined a lot of things and talked about a lot of very sort of abstract notions. Let's talk about some examples of model structures. So um, the classical one, uh, one is a SARE model structure on the category of topological spaces. Um, and because of, because of this overdeterminedness, I'm just specifying two of the classes in each case because we can always get the third from them. Um, so the weak equivalences are weak homotopy equivalences. So that's isomorphisms, things that I induce isomorphisms on um, 
homotopy groups basically, and something about path components, basically like to get the same number of path components. Um, and everything that lifts on the right with respect to the inclusion of a disk into the cylinder from that. So that's so the CF vibration is is F for um where for any map of this form. Uh, here. There's a lift here. Um, all right. Uh, the Hravich model structure on top. Now Could instead, you maybe say something about what the co-fibrations are for this air model structure? Uh, the the co-fibrations are um, the co-fibrations are relative relative. Um, I want to say CW relative cell complexes. Right, right. Um, which is what pullbacks of maps which attach cells. Is so this that... this came up in a in a previous talk. I'm I'm trying to remember exactly why, but the but but th this is like a CW complex in that you attach cells, but you don't have to attach them in order of dimension. Um, and then I think you can also take retracts of those, which are not, which are not of that form, right. but, and those also give you co I mean, I mean, but, the... but in particular, in particular, an inclusion of a CW subcomplex into a CW complex is an example of a co-fibration in this model structure. I'm done now. Yeah, I mean, def definitely, it should be closed under retract because this C fits into a refactorization system. And so it has all the closure properties that we, we mentioned before, the lifting on the left. Um, all right. So the Horevich model structure, now instead of taking weak homotopy equivalents, we take actual homotopy equivalences. Um, and the Horevich vibrations are, um, well, they're, so both of these classes include the same class from the, um, from the, SAM model structure, um, which means that there will be fewer co-fibrations, right? Because um, if there are more weak equivalences and more fibrations, then there are at least as many, um, there are at least as many acyclic fibrations, um, which the co-fibrations have to lift against. So it's harder to lift against them, basically. Um, all right. Then on simplicial set, uh, on the category of simplicial sets, we have a model structure where the weak equivalences are maps that are weak homotopy equivalences after geometric realization at the top. And the co-fibrations are just those maps which are monomorphisms on each um, N. Uh, in the category of R modules, we had a model structure for R of Frobenius ring, um, uh, where the co-fibrations are injections and the um, fibrations are surjections. The projective model structure on uh, chain complexes of R modules concentrated in non-negative degrees. Um, the weak equivalence is a quasi-isomorphism, so that's uh, chain maps which induce an isomorphism on homology. And the co-fibrations are chain maps that are injective for each N and have projective co-kernel. Um, the fibrations in this model... Questions? Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, what's uh, Frobenius ring? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I gave this talk a very long time ago and I wrote this down. I think I, when I did that, I knew what it meant, but I do not know now. So it's it's a ring with the property that a module is projective if and only if it's injective. Um, I think the the canonical examples are group, group rings um, over a field. Uh, and the thing that this model structure does, I'm still, I'm not, this is like a kind of a classical, like simple example of a model structure, but I'm not really sure if like actual representation theorists use it. Um, 
But, but one of the things that it does is it makes the projective slash injective modules contractible. So you can sort of isolate the, um, like if you, if you want to think about uh, representations of your group over a field, but you want to factor out everything that's, that's like a, a free module or a, a regular representation of the group, then that's, this is a tool to do it. And then, sorry, would you mind going back a little bit? What was the, the model structure on judicial sets? Right, so the weak, the weak equivalent is there's this, there's a geometric realization functor from simplicial sets to topological spaces. And so given a, given a map in simplicial sets, you do, you geometrically realize it. And if that's a weak homotopy equivalence, so if it's a weak equivalence under the SER um, model structure, then it's a weak equivalence in this model structure. Um, and the co-fibrations are, um, are the maps, the monomorphisms on, on each level of the simplicial set. You know, does this kind of thing usually work if you have a model structure on some category, you can kind of go to a different category and just kind of push it through a uh, functor? Um, so I'm gonna talk more about this specific model structure um, because it's, uh, because it relates, it, it, Basically, this model structure and the same model structure um, give you the same homotopy category. So it tells you that, like, um, homotopically, at least with these these model structures, um, simplicial sets and uh, and and um, and top are the same uh, uh, up to homotopy. Um, all right. Uh, but I mean, I imagine in this in this course we're going to see a lot of um, a lot of uh, model structures being lifted lifted in some way um, because we're going to be putting them on like um, we're going to be taking model structures and putting them on functor like and turning them into model structures on functor categories. Um, all right. So an object in a model category is cofibrant uh, if the map to it from the initial object is a cofibration. Remember that model categories are bicomplete, so in particular they have initial and terminal objects. Um, X is fibrant if the map to the terminal object is a fibration. Um, y is a cofibrant replacement. Um, for X, if Y is cofibrant, and there is a weak equivalence uh, from Y to X. Uh, and then in the other direction, we have uh, fibrant replacements um, are those with, so it has to be fibrant and it has to have a map from the object to the replacement. Okay, we can always find uh, fibrant and cofibrant um, replacements. Uh, and we do that by factoring, we can either fa factor the initial map. Um, and so we'll get this X cof. Um, so, uh, so we have this factorization of the initial map and that gets us a cofibrant replacement for X. Um, and we can factor the terminal map uh, to get a fibrant replacement for X. And I'm gonna get that. Um, and, and so in particular, if our um, factorization that came with our model structure is, um, if we have a functorial factorization, then fibrant and cofibrant replacement are, functor are, like, are functors, which is nice. Uh, in the same model structure on top, all objects are fibrant and cofibrant replacement is CW approximation. Um, and in the category of simplicial sets, all objects are cofibrant. All right. So uh, now I want to talk about, so um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you get in a model category that help you um, 
sort of use homotope, like use the 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 language of homotopy um, from like topological homotopy in 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 your model categories. So a cylinder object is um, a diagram of the form. So we're taking cylinder objects for x. We're going to take the co-product of x with itself. Um, and then we take the fold map. And so this is induced by the identity on each of the um, things. Uh, and then we factor it um, using the factorization, which is a cofibration followed by an acyclic fibration. Um, so I'll call this R and I'll call this I0, I1. All right, um, now we can get it so that, um, so that, uh, that, that, um, okay, so these, these two things here just follow from the, follow from factorization, um, but we can also uh, get it so that these two are weak equivalences and that's called a very good path uh, cylinder object. I don't want to think about that too much. Um, in topological spaces, a cylinder object is a cylinder, um, which is nice. And then a left homotopy between two maps is a map H from a cylinder object on X to Y such that, um, such that doing H uh, such that sort of using the compositions, um, you get you get F and on the other side of the cylinder, basically, uh, you get G. So this is classically what we think of as a, as a homotopy in topological spaces. Um, similarly, there's a notion of path object. So uh, now we're sort of doing the dual thing. So instead of, um, Instead of thinking about a map from the co-product to the co-product to copies of X to X, I'm going to think about um, a map from Y to the product of two copies of Y. And I have a map here that's the diagonal map, uh, which is whatever map is induced by the universal property of products where the map from Y to each copy of Y is the identity. Um, and now I'm going to factor this again. So I'm going to get path object on Y. And now I want this to be the, the cofibration to be acyclic. S. And this is E. So in, in the cylinder object, we had I0 and I1, which you might think of as inclusion into, the, into 0 and inclusion into 1. Here we have E0 and E1 which you might think of as evaluate at zero and evaluate at one. Um, all right, and now we ask that, um, oh, no. so now a right homotopy is a map uh, H from X to the path space on Y. Um, and now we ask that uh, following that with evaluation gets you F on one side and following it by evaluation on the other side gets you G. All right, and um, if you, this is, this is a good place to think about this adjunction in topological spaces, um, which uh, if you haven't seen before, you can uh, think of, of um, a home, like, a homotopy is a map from X cross I to Y, but it's that's exactly the same thing as a map from X to the space of paths in Y. Um, all right. Now, so in topological spaces, these are the same thing, but that's not necessarily the case in some arbitrary model category. Um, so we're going to call F and G homotopic. Uh, which we denote the way we usually denote homotopy, uh, if they are both left and right homotopic to each other. Uh, and something I'm not going to prove, 
is that um, if X is cofibrant and Y is fibrant, then homotopy, uh, which is both left and right, is an equivalence on the class of maps in that model category between those two objects. And I'm going to call an equivalence class a homotopy class. Uh, and denote them like this. All right. So, uh, in there. Um, <clears throat> given a category with some like good class of weak equivalences, the homotopy category is sort of um, so we map a functor from its homotopy category. Uh, and I've got some other degree and a map and a functor to that, uh, such that uh, F of F is an isomorphism whenever F is a weak equivalence, then uh, the then then the homotopy category is sort of the initial thing. All 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 functors which invert the weak equivalences factor through the homotopy category. Um, that's sort of the universal property. Uh, one nice thing about a model category is that we have a very explicit construction of this. Um, and the homotopy category of a model category M, it has the same object as M, but instead the morphisms are given by, um, so we take the maps in the model category between the cofibrant replace the fibrant replacement of the cofibrant replacement of F, and the fibrant replacement of the cofibrant replacement of Y. I think you can reverse those um, without it mattering. Uh, and quotient by the equivalence class of homotopy, which, as we mentioned above, because um, because it's because that object in the first part is cofibrant and the object in the second part is fibrant, um, this will be, and this homotopy does define an equivalence relation. And that's, so that's, that's our definition of homotopy category. Um, all right, so now I've described model categories. I've described the thing that we really care about, which is the homotopy category. So now I should talk about functors that preserve these things in some way. So, we have two model categories, M and N. A uh, functor from M to N is left quillen if it preserves cofibrations and uh, acyclic cofibrations. So it's left quillen if it sends things that are lifted against things that lift on the left against, fi uh, against vibrations and acyclic vibrations, if, if it sends them to things that still lift against those things. Um, so yeah, so if, if vibrations or acyclic vibrations lifted against them in M, then they still do after passage to N. And so similarly, a right quillen functor from N to M is one which preserves vibrations and um, acyclic vibrations. Um, so if we have an adjunction between two model categories, uh, it's a quillen adjunction if F is uh, left quillen and G is right quillen. Right, so, so quillen functors are ones that preserve some of the lifting, basically. Or well, they preserve lifting on one side. Um, all right. It so, might be worth mentioning that it, if F is left quillen, then, then a right adjoint to F is automatically right quillen and vice versa. So this uh, is a nice little exercise for, for everybody. All right. Um, Okay, so if we have uh, a left quillen functor, the left derived functor of it is um, LF is a functor from the homotopy category on M. Oh, 
the homotopy category of M to the homotopy category of N, uh, and it's given by um, LF is F applied to um, the, a cofibrant replacement of X. Um, and then obviously you have to pass to the homotopy category of N. Uh, and similarly, if you have a right quillen functor, it's right derived functor, uh, G is a functor from the homotopy category of N to the homotopy category of M, and it's given by fiber replacement. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, equivalent adjunction um, is equivalent equivalence if uh, if the two derived the left derived functor and the right derived functor form an uh, adjoint equivalence. That's sorry, a uh, question here. So. Do you just have one derived functor, or does it have some kind of like grading that would carry around like usual higher derived functors? Uh, you just have the one derived functor. I... Can I say something about that? Yes, please. Uh, unless so, so you're you're thinking about functors being defined on chain complexes, and in this, like chain complexes are one of the examples that Evo mentioned, and. Um, <laughs> And so in this setting, you get derived functors that are valued in the homotopy category of chain complexes. And what like an algebraic geometer would call the higher derived functors or something are just the, the various um, homology groups of this of these kind of derived functors. I hope that made sense. Okay. Um, so now the, the example that I promised to talk about before. Um, so uh, we have here, here is an example of two different Quillen equivalences. Um, so we have the functor from, we have the, the adjoint pair that takes topological spaces to the, to, to the singular um, set, of, set of simpler. It's the sing functor. It's, it's the simplicial set. Uh, <laughs> it's a simplicial set of all maps from the topological, like, Sn of x is the simplicial set of all maps from the topological n simplex into x. That gives you a simplicial set. Uh, this, is, this has an adjoint, which is geometric realization. And not only are these adjoint, they form equivalent equivalents, which means that um, they're sort of the same up to, like they have the same homotopy category up to equivalence is the point. And these two functors realize that. Now, if you go sort of around this, you have this functor from Z to simplicial set, um, that from simplicial sets to simplicial abelian groups, that just sort of takes the, um, the free abelian group on your simplicial set. Uh, and then we have this other, um, this other coolant equivalence between simplicial abelian groups and positive uh, non-negative, um, chain complexes of abelian groups. Uh, and this is the dolt kahn correspondence. Now I've written that like this, you can take um, homology of, of a chain complex and you get a graded abelian group. If you go along this um, around, like from top to grab, you, you get the usual, um, the usual definition of, the usual functor of um, homology for a space, even though, um, what's happening in the Dolt Khan correspondence is actually not the usual take the alternating sum of differentials to get a differential. Um, okay, uh, because I'm pressed for time, I'm not gonna spend much more time on that um, other than to say that it's, a, it's an, it, these are two important examples of equivalent equivalences. Um, 
Uh, I just want to say one last thing, which is about cofibrantly generated model structures. So model stru a model structure is cofibrantly generated um, if there exists sets I and J of morphisms such that, um, you know, I'm going to get this in the right order. Uh, the class of maps which lift on the left against the class of maps which lift on the right against I and the class of maps which lift against on the right against I is this is the weak equivalence of co-fibrations and acyclic vibrations. And similarly for J, uh, this is the class of um, acyclic co-fibrations and vibrations. Um, so generating co-fibrations and J is the generating uh, acyclic co-fibrations. Um, and we have an example, the model struct up co-fibrantly generated. It's co-fibrantly, it's, it's um, generating co-fibrations are the inclusions of boundaries into spheres into inclusions of boundaries onto disks and the generating acyclic co-fibrations are the inclusions of disks into their um, their cylinder objects. All right. Um, now it's not immediately clear that this thing that should be a weak factorization uh, system. Uh, there's a theorem called the small object argument and it says that if you have a co-complete category, so it has all, all small co-limits, um, and you have a set of maps whose domains are sequentially small, which is why I've written baby here, because you can actually ask for them just to be small relative to some cardinal or ordinal, um, then, then this always describes a weak factorization system on M. Uh, and that's a, it's, it's a very misleadingly named theorem. The small object argument involves taking uh, massive pushouts, possibly transfinitely many times. And in, so it's like actually just really big objects. Um, smallness is about smallness relative to some, some cardinal or ordinal. All right, uh, I have to go teach. So thanks everybody. Let's uh, thank Evo. Thank you so much, Evo. This was great. Um, that was not too, too hope you're teaching all over the well. place. Thanks. It's the first class of semester. Oh, sweet. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. So, um, yeah, let me stop.